you wanted to become a Navy SEAL. You became a Navy SEAL. Yeah, so. so here you are, you're, you're a believer, you're a follower of Christ. You believe in winning souls for Christ, but at the same time, too, taking name, taking souls yeah. uh, uh, as a Navy SEAL. Because it's not like you're uh, a nonprofit peacekeeping <laughs> mission. You are, you're there to we surgically. Were, we were not in the Peace Corps. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I joined right out of high school. I knew from a young age that I wanted to serve and probably serve in the military. Uh, I thought I wanted to be a pilot for a long time, but I grew up in a culture that, that taught servant leadership. Pastor Keith, at a young age, when I, when I was young and the church is just starting, he would talk yeah. about servant leadership, mm -hmm. right? And that's the model that Christ gives us of servant leadership. And I knew I wanted to serve, and I felt like I also needed to represent you know, my family and my, my church family by serving in the military. Yeah. And there's a prayer um, that I've like prayed a couple times in my life, and, and each time I've prayed it, God has... Uh, answered it in, in a profound way. But when I was like young and in my teenage years, sometimes I would pray, God, why did you make me this way? Because I felt very different and I felt like I had skills and abilities that I didn't know what to do with them. And at the end of my time in high school, I thought I'd wanted to be a pilot, uh, but I learned about SEAL training. I watched a, an awesome documentary called Bud's Class 234. <laughs> if you haven't watched it, go check it out. You don't have to watch the whole thing. It's about four hours long, but it is a really- Was it a History Channel? Or it was, was a Discovery your, yeah, Channel yeah. documentary. Discovery. Bud's class 234. Everything that's in there is true. I'll just tell you, that's not everything. There's stuff about SEAL training that doesn't make it in the documentary, right. obviously, but everything that's in the documentary is true. And I saw that and I immediately knew this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Um, every man's asking himself the same question, Matt. And that question is, am I who I think that I am? Right? We want to, like, we think something of right. ourselves. We want to know, is this who we really are? Mm -hmm. And what I knew for SEAL team, the, what SEAL training would be for me was an opportunity to test that. But, so I wanted to serve. I wanted to test who I was. And I also wanted to go and be around the best of the best. If I was going to join the military, and I knew there's, there's a life risk when you do that. You, you signed that, that mm -hmm. same contract sure. that you, it could have cost you your life. If I was going to be in that situation, I wanted to pay the price, be around the best. I wanted to, if, yeah. if it's in the most difficult situation, at least know that the guy next to me yeah. is willing to pay an incredible price too. Um, so I made it through SEAL training. Uh, I started Bud's Class 286. I got pinned with Bud's Class 289, one of a handful of students under 20 years old in my class to make it through training. Most people just don't make it that young. And just to- How old were you? I was 19 when I started. Dang. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I'm sorry, I, was 20, I, I just turned 20. I was 20 when I started, okay. graduated at 21. But most people uh, don't make it through at that young age. The average age in my class was almost 25, a bunch of NCAA athletes, college educated, far, far more physically prepared, yeah. and in some ways mentally prepared. And if you, you know, you might ask the question, like, what allowed you to do that at a young age? I can tell you, like, I went in, in some ways, I went in there extremely unprepared for SEAL training. A lot of these guys had been like in physically? It, uh, somewhat physically. Because okay. um, you're, you're athletic in high school. I was, but like I said, it's a bunch of NCAA. I was a good athlete. I wasn't a great athlete. Right, we can go play anything, and I'm gonna do all right. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. if I'd have, if I'd have gone to college, I'd have probably walked on to athletics, you know, like right. a D three. But you were getting a scholarship. Yeah, I wouldn't uh, get an yeah, athletic scholarship. Okay. Yeah, um, but so some there were so many guys in my class that were like our good buddy Steve Weatherford. Did. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> Shout Steve, out to Steve Weatherford, man. Yeah, he's a different kind of human <laughs> for um, sure. The vanilla these, gorilla, yeah. the vanilla gorilla. Yeah. Some of these guys were incredibly athletically gifted all of that, or they'd been in a SEAL training pipeline with a SEAL mentor yeah. for years. The first SEALs that I met were my instructors, right? Like I didn't know much about this program. I literally watched a documentary. I read a book called Warrior Soul and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go do this. Wow. And uh, what's interesting about that is because I, it's different now. I, I work with a lot of tadpoles, guys who are trying to become SEALs and they know so much about the program. Whereas back then I knew so little. Uh, yeah. One of the difficult things we would do in SEAL training called log PT, which you're, which which comes from this is, log PT part of SEAL training comes from World War II uh, POWs, oh, wow. right? Like wow. they experienced this wow. as a POW, and like if you read the book Unbroken, he talks mm -hmm. about this, right? And they yeah. came and brought that back to SEAL training. They said this would be this is a great training tool. Um, but anyways, I thought that was every day and like, I was mentally prepared for that. And then I was like, Oh, it's only twice a week. Yeah. This isn't that bad. So there were some strengths to not being, uh, as prepared as others, but really the strength that I had, because really I was, uh, in the beginning of SEAL training, you get tested just athletically. Let's just see where everyone's at athletically. Right. And, and being a SEAL is not about being an athlete. 
Um, because if it was, that's who they would recruit as just athletes. Yeah. You just need a measure of athletic ability. But when they tested us all athletically, run, swim, strength training, I'm in the bottom third of the class. Wow. Right? So I'm, I'm in terms of time and yep, how quick time, you do something. Yep, times runs on runs and swims. And swims. I, I'm, I'm strong. I didn't struggle yeah. in that area, but I was not a, you know, we, we had collegiate runners. There was a guy who was an Olympic trialist <laughs> as a runner sponsored by Adidas. Um, so, or, or guys that, you know, were, Winning uh, titles and, and banners at Arizona as a swimmer. I mean, so incredible yeah, athletes. These guys run like a four-minute miles type guys. For yeah. sure. Well, they're, I mean, I barely passed all of my four-mile timed runs by like <laughs> seconds. And at the end of Bud's, like it's down to 28 minutes, right? There were guys who would show up how, and for run. how many miles? Four miles. Four miles and 28 minutes. Four miles, 28 minutes, but that's in pants and boots on the beach. Oh, wow. So it's, it's, you're moving, but there were guys who could do it in 24, 70, I mean, 20, 24, 45 yeah. and no problem. Right. Yeah. Like, and it was all that I had yeah. to do that. But wow. anyways, to bring that back to the point, what I did have that other people didn't have was a sense of purpose and destiny on my life. Uh, something I heard all growing up, right. I talked about having two fathers. My, my parents said this to me all the time growing up. They'd say, Garrett, God has a plan for your life. Right. Since I was five years old, they would tell me that, Matt. I didn't. Most people would think, like, why would you tell a five year old that? And, and truly, I mean, from the time I was five years old, they would tell me that. Why would you tell a five year old that? He has no idea what it means. No, he doesn't. He has no idea what it means. I remember that they said it when I was five. Right. And so just a, a thought and a lesson for you fathers. I'm a father as well, but I got a I got a two year old and a two week old. So I don't know a ton from experience. I know two weeks. Two weeks. Holy moly, yeah, man. Two, two, I got one that's two, two years board. and one that's two weeks. I don't know a ton from having been a father, but I know a lot from having been a son of a great, of a great father. And my, what a profound statement. My parents would speak over my life, right? So when I'm five years old, God has a great plan for your life. Didn't mean anything to me at five. Didn't mean anything to me at 10. Barely meant anything when I was 15. But when I would face difficult times when I'm 19, when I'm facing difficult times when I'm 20, when I think my life's over when I'm 22 years old, I'm reminded of how many times this has been spoken over me, and you get the opportunity to test it and know that it's true. And so just a reminder for you parents, um, don't think that you can't speak into your children's life. Yeah. You can. You can plant seeds that grow later. Right? Don't, don't, don't not speak into their life just because you think they don't understand now. They don't have to understand. They'll remember. Yeah. Right? So the one thing that my parents did was they would always say, God has a plan for your life. And then they would tell me something else. They would say, you can have anything you want in life as long as you're willing to pay the price for it. And I call that potential. When you put those two things together, purpose, God has a plan for your life, and you can have anything you want in life as long as you're willing to pay the price for it, potential, I call that infinite potential. Mm. And that's for, that's for anybody. But you have to believe those things and work on those things. If you think it's that one of my favorite quotes, Matt, is Henry Ford, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're, you're right. right. And it's a self-fulfilling, <laughs> it's, it's a self-fulfilling truth. If you don't believe it, you're right. If you believe that, you're right. And whether you can, if you can have anything you want as long as you're willing to pay, pay the price for it, that's self-fulfilling. And I like to pair with that now, Ray Dalio says, you can have anything you want, you just can't have everything you want. You have to get focused, right? But there's a, there was a moment for me where this kind of all culminated. At the end of Hell Week, which is a very difficult portion of SEAL training, this is the fourth week. Full seven days. Yep. You start on Sunday night, and you don't finish until Friday. You get one hour of sleep on Wednesday, one hour of sleep on Thursday. That's it. You'll run over 200 miles during that time. Holy moly. Most of that is with a boat, like these Zodiacs yeah. on your head, six guys under a boat. It will test you to your very core. And what they know at the end of that training is that if you can make it that far, every single man that's still there would like literally keep going until they, they fell out and died. Um, it's an incredible test of, of what's within a man. What, what, type of, what type of guy were you under the boat? Were you the type of guy that was just silent, strong, steady? Or were you the guy that said, come on, get, you know, I can tell, pick, pick, up, pick up your side that's of the boat? Where, that's where I had strength. Uh, was in those difficult moments because I, I wasn't the fastest runner. Yeah. I wasn't the fastest swimmer. Yeah. But when we were being tested and, and it required all of us, that's where a different side of me would come yeah. out. Um, but coming back to, to Hell Week, 
it kind of all culminated for me, this infinite, infinite potential culminated for me at the, in a moment at the end of hell week, because coming into this, I'd been incredibly discouraged. Now I didn't feel discouraged, but people had discouraged me. My, my whole training program from the time I got in, a seal. yeah, from the time I got in, uh, my roommate in pre buds, his father was a Navy seal. He had been to buds before number one athlete in the class. Every day he would say, uncle Bach, you have no chance. Right. And you would think this guy knows a little bit. Right. His father was a master chief Navy SEAL over 20 years. He was the number one athlete in the class, top ranked. He'd been to buds before. He was back on his second attempt. And he'd say, you have no chance here. He would tell me that all the time. And there was a lot of I could I could go on and on. There was a lot of ways that uh, outside circumstances would discourage me, tell me that I didn't have a chance here. But I remember from the very beginning thinking of joining SEAL training. You can look at all of the people that didn't make it right, because there's only there's a little over four thousand Navy SEALs living and dead. Mm-hmm. There's tens of thousand that have tried. Right, the failure rate is so high. If if you look at it from the very top of the pipeline down to people who become SEALs, yeah. it's a little over eighty percent failure rate. Yeah. And you could look at that and think like, man, how could anyone ever do it? But what I looked at was there's thousands of men who have done it, mm-hmm. and if it can be done, then I'm going to do it. Yeah. Right. But this infinite potential all culminated for me at a moment at the end of Hell Week, right before we started Hell Week. Guys in my boat crew were we were, were sitting in a classroom waiting for Hell Week to start, and that's the painful part, right? Because <laughs> the calm before the, the storm. Yeah, right. The, <laughs> the 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 hardest part of pain is the anticipation of the pain, and we know we're all about to go through one of the most painful things we've ever been through. And they would just let you sit there in the classroom for hours waiting for it to start. It was difficult, but we would all my my boat crew. We all talked like, "Hey, do you think you'll make it? Hey, do you think you'll make it?" And at this point, because I was young and because of the way that I'd been treated. I hadn't spoken up that much or really told people what I thought. But then they finally asked me, hey, do you think you'll make it? And I said, not only do I think I'll make it, I know I'll make it. And not only am I going to make it, but on Saturday when Hell Week is over, everyone's walking around on crutches, guys have sipe, you know, blood in their lungs like people are beaten and destroyed. What I'm going to do is go for a run on the beach by myself. I told my boat crew this, right? And they just, you know, they just laughed at me. But, well, I would tell you the ones who, who la- some guys were just like, whatever. The guys who laughed at me didn't make it through training. They didn't finish Hell Week. But to bring this to a point, at the end of Hell Week, I went on that run, right? I went on that run, and if you know uh, Coronado, mm-hmm. the rocks out in front of the yeah. Dell, I ran down uh, about a mile from the compound, got to the rocks, and it was raining that day. You know, great, great luck there. All you want to do after Hell Week is just be dry. dry. Um, but it's raining that morning, but I go on this run and I get down there to the rocks and I sit on the rocks and I just kind of have a moment with myself and realize that this is a dream that I've dreamed for the last couple of years and to finally see it come to happen and to also for all of that to come true, the, the things that my parents have spoken over me, that God has a plan for your life, right? Cause there's so many, there's, there's elements of SEAL training that you can't control. And there's a lot of reasons that, I mean, I could tell you there's reasons why I shouldn't have become a SEAL. But there's also a lot of reasons why I did become a SEAL, right? So you could see God's plan there, and you could also see the potential that you can have anything you want as long as you're willing to pay the price for it. I don't have all the skills and abilities that other people had, but what I did have was the willingness to do the work. And so those things like just in that moment there on the rocks, realizing that I had dreamed a dream and seen it come true was a very powerful moment for me. And it also helped me realize the most powerful thing isn't what others see in you, but it's what you see in yourself. So if you like that clip, please watch this one right here. If you want to see the full podcast, click right here.